This video will guide you through the creation of new archival descriptions. It is assumed that the viewer already has a working familiarity with the rules for archival description. We'll look at commonly used fields and enter an example font description. To begin, click the plus in the header bar and then archival descriptions. This is the archival description add and edit form. Each of these sections can be toggled open or closed with a click. When you click on any field, a description of the purpose of the field and associated RAD rules pops up. Users are encouraged to explore all fields in this data entry form, but we will discuss the more commonly used ones. There are a few different kinds of fields in this form. You can generally get a sense of each field by clicking on it, but let's look at the common types. Single line, single entry text fields, such as the title proper, take a single value which can be anything that you supply. Multi line text entry fields, such as the scope and content field, take free text generally in paragraph form. Line breaks will be preserved to create multi paragraph text. A feature of most multi line text entry fields is that the lines which start with an asterisk will be displayed as bulleted entries once the description is saved. Single value read ahead free text selectors, such as the repository field, look like regular text fields but work differently. As we type text into this type of field, the system will present options matching the text we've entered just below. In this manner, we can search for possible values from a potentially very long list of options. If and when we see a value we want, we click to select it. Only up to 10 values are shown in this list below at a time. If we click on such a field and wait a moment, we'll see the first 10 options sorted alphabetically. Multiple value read ahead free text selectors also exist, such as the language of material field in the notes section. Once again, we can search for a value by beginning to type it out and then clicking in the list which pops up below. Each time we do this, the selected field is added to a list just above the form. To remove a value from this list, click on it, like so. Single value drop-down selectors, such as the level of description field, allow users to select a single entry from a fixed list of options. Multiple value drop-down selectors, such as the general material designation, allow users to select multiple entries, one at a time, from a fixed list of options. Each time we click one, it is added to a list above the selector. It may not be immediately clear, but to remove a selected entry, we simply click on it, like so. Repeatable selectable notes, such as the title notes, allow users to choose a type and include a multi-line text entry field. Additional note fields can be added by clicking Add New or removed by clicking the X. Any such entries which are left blank will be ignored when the record is saved. Now let's look at commonly used fields by area. Title and Statement of Responsibility area. Title proper is absolutely necessary. General Material Designation is optional but nice to set if your institution uses it. Level of Description is also a necessary field. Repository, again, is necessary. This refers to the name of your institution. You should only be able to select your own institution here, but you should do this every time. This will control ownership of the record. Identifier, or reference code, is also considered mandatory, at least for top-level descriptions. RAD notes specific to the title are found here, such as variations in title, which might be used to indicate variant or previous titles of the description. Edition area. The fields in this area should be used for published items only. Class of material specific details area. 
This area is only for a few very specific cases. Dates of creation area. This is where we specify both name authorities as creators and enter dates of creation, or to a lesser extent, dates of collection, publication, contribution, etc. Entries in this area are added by clicking Add New. An extra small form pops up. In the Actor field, we choose a name authority record for a person, family, or corporate body. We need to create name authority records for our descriptions before entering the descriptions themselves, so that we may select them here. This is a single value read ahead free text selector. To choose a name authority, we'd begin by typing the authorized form of name for the authority, and then select a value in the list which is populated below. The event type is almost always creation, but we could specify other types of activities in this form also. Generally, we don't specify a place in which creation took place, but rather link to place access points later on. Date, start, and end are all about dates of creation. If you enter a date or range of dates in the date field, the start and end dates of that range should automatically be populated as soon as you click outside of the date field. We can also set start and end dates manually. We can add additional entries by clicking Add New. Notably, we can add dates of creation entries with just dates and no creator. Likewise, we can add entries with creators and no date. We can edit existing entries by clicking on them anywhere, except for the X. And we can delete entries by clicking the X. Linking to creators here will cause information from those creators' authority records to be included in the displayed archival description upon saving. Note that changes to these entries are not saved until this record is ultimately saved at the bottom. Physical description area. Rad extent and medium statements go here. Place each specific material designation on its own line. Publishers series area. This would be used for published items only. Archival description area. The custodial history field would be used where records were not received directly from their creator. Scope and content is one of the more important fields in archival descriptions. and is used to describe the main record types, their arrangement, the types of activities which generated the records, etc. Rad rules give specific guidance. Notably, a snippet of the scope and content field is included in search results for archival descriptions. Notes area. The notes area is quite large and should include all possible RAD note types. Some of these note types are located in an other notes section towards the bottom of this area as repeatable selectable notes. Multiple such notes are accommodated by clicking Add New to bring up additional subforms. Most of these fields are freeform multi line text fields with a few exceptions. Language of material and script of material are multiple value read ahead text selectors describing the language and script of the archival materials. Standard number area. This would be used for published materials only. Access points area. If you wish to add subject or place terms, you may do so here. Each of these fields is a multi-value read-ahead text selector, meaning you can search for terms by beginning to type them out and select a term from the results presented by clicking on it. Each time you do so, a term is added to a growing list. 
To remove a selected term, click on it. The Name Access Points field allows us to associate authority records as subjects rather than creators. This is not the place to indicate creatorship of an archival description. This was done previously in the Dates of Creation area. In most cases, users would not use this section. Control Area This section isn't part of RAD, rather it's for recording information about the description we've just been entering. The contents of these fields are not shown to non-logged-in users, and so it may be used for internal notes. Rights area is not used at this time. Administration area. There are three elements in this section. Display standard. A to M allows a number of display standards, each associated with a metadata standard. This should be left blank, in which case the system will use its default standard, RAD. Changing the display standard could cause loss of data. Source language indicates the language in which this description is written. It's possible to translate a description, which we'll show in a later video, but the source language, meaning the original language of the first description, is fixed. Lastly, publication status has only two options, draft and published. Archival descriptions saved in draft status are hidden from non-logged in users. Only when published are they visible to the general public. Users with a contributor role will only see draft as an option here. The desired workflow in MemoryNS involves a contributor creating draft archival descriptions for review by an editor. Upon review, an editor would either publish the descriptions, making them visible to the general public, or see that necessary changes were made. Smaller institutions which lack the human resources to implement a multi-person, creator, and editor workflow can request editorial service by contacting the CNSA Archives Advisor. Now we'll walk through a very basic example in which we create a new archival description as a contributor, then review and publish it as an editor. The example we'll use is cribbed from the Yukon Council of Archives basic RAD guide. First, we'll log in as a contributor. Next, we need to determine whether a name authority record already exists for our creator. Finding that no such name authority exists, we'll create a new one with the information we have. Now we'll set about creating a new archival description. There are 10 elements we always want to include or consider with archival descriptions. Title, level of description, repository or institution, reference code or identifier, dates of creation, creator access point, biographical sketch, physical description, scope and content, subject and place access points if applicable. Let's leave this list up for reference. In our sample description, we have five pieces of information, but our biographic sketch has already been incorporated into a new name authority record. This leaves four new data elements. We'll input each section in turn, keeping in mind our reference list. I'll be copying and pasting between two tabs here. First, we have a title, which goes in the title proper field in the title and statement of responsibility area. While we're in this area, we will also set the repository to be our archival institution, and we'll set the level of description, which is evident from the title. If we don't have a reference code yet, we should assign one. How you do this in practice is up to your institution. Next, we have dates of creation, which we'll add to the dates of creation area. We'll simultaneously add our creator access point, which will incorporate our new authority records biographic sketch.
We'll add our extent data to the physical description area. We'll enter our scope and content in the archival description area. All that remains on our checklist is subject and place access points. We have none, and that's okay. If we look in the administration area, only the draft publication status is available to us because we are logged in as a contributor. When we save or create this record, we can review it. We can see the word draft in parentheses in the title of the page. So far, this record is inaccessible to the public. If we wish to amend the record, we can click the edit button at the bottom. Now we'll log out and log in as an editor to review and publish the description. If as editor we don't have a direct link to the record, we can find it either by searching or by browsing for our institution's most recent archival descriptions. Assuming we're satisfied with the description as it stands, we would then edit the record, open the administration area, change the publication status to published, and save. That's it. You should now know how to create and publish archival descriptions.